I'm Jonathan Lehman. And I'm Mark Dever. And welcome to this episode of Nine Marks Pastors Talk. Nine Marks exists to equip church leaders with a biblical vision and practical resources for... The glory of God in the local church. Something like that. Learn more at... Ninemarks.org. Mark, or ChevroletBaptist.com. I don't think it's there. Okay. But here we are in this big hall. What is this big hall? This is the uh, exhibit hall at the Birmingham... Convention Civic Center. Center. And you'll hear in the background people milling about and talking. Mark and I here at the it's Southern like Baptist Convention. It's like we're at Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> it's nothing like that. But um, since we're at the convention, Mark, I want to think about denominational life. All right. What's a denomination? Well, denomination is a word that means name or a way to distinguish one group from another. When In English, the way we're using it these days, it usually is in terms of a religious group and it's going to mean one of the, usually the pro, historically one of the Protestant denominations, so Lutheran, Anglican, Reformed, Presbyterian, Congregational, Baptist, Methodist, and they kept going on. I think of Garrison Keillor making fun of his own Minnesota Lutheranism with the song, "We sit in the pew where we always sit, and we do not shout Amen, and if anyone yells or waves their hands, they're not invited back again." Aren't denominations basically a sign of our disunity in the body of Christ? Kind of. Uh, that's, that's been the sort of 1970s Jesus people and on take of being critical toward denominations. I think denominations are a sign of the fact that we've got religious freedom and that we have a conscience and that God in his strange providence, though he has made scripture perspicuous or clear on everything that we need to know in order to be saved, he has allowed there to be things that we can disagree on and still be Christians and yet affect our lives together and our churches. So some things you and I could disagree about, it wouldn't affect our life together in our local church. Millennium. Like the millennium. Uh, other things that we disagree about might affect our li or would affect our lives together in a local church. Baptism. Baptism, well, women as elders. Um, yeah. So... You're describing a denomination as a charitable concession, which preserves a form of unity, albeit not necessarily inter or person, you know, church to church unity, but between churches, unity. Well, like, I'm not going to bind your conscience on pedo baptism. You're not right. going to bind mine. We're going to concede that. It, it's saying rather than try to coerce people's consciences to all be in a church where we have this one practice, or where we will not allow only one practice that we think is biblical. Uh, we're going to allow you to associate freely with whoever, legally, and then you cooperate together as much as you can. So I would say that denominations are simply a way for us to find other brothers and sisters who are reading Scripture in the same way that we are on particular matters and to work together with them. So I can work with my Presbyterian friends and my Methodist friends who are evangelicals in evangelistic crusades. I can't really plant a church with my Methodist friends or with my Presbyterian friends because it's going to affect how you're going to do church. I can't plan a church actually with some of my Baptist friends who have different convictions about some things that are very uh, specific when you get into real life. What are you going to do or not do? I'll come back to that in a second. Can you give us a super fast history of denominations? Yeah, I mean, I just, I just gave you the order they developed chronologically from the Reformation. I'll do it again if you so want. So as you were listing them, you had a chronology in mind. Yeah, I'm I was too giving slow them to pick as that they up. happened. Okay, do that again, so, but slow it down. Okay, Lutheran. Okay, they're the first. We've got to have Anabaptists in there. All right. Reformed. Anglican. So like Calvin and so forth. Yeah, well, Zwingli before Calvin. Uh, and then, uh, you know, then you've got to have the Anglicans. Eventually the Church of England shows Well, they're up. all developing. All of those three are developing in the 1520s and 1530s. It's hard to put one nose in front of the other. Right. Lutheran you can put a little bit ahead, but it's, you know. And then after that, you have the congregations developing by the 1570s, 60s, 70s, the Brownists. And then you have the Baptists developing by early part of the 1600s. 1605, 1610. Yeah. Um, and then the sort of Calvinistic Baptists out of the Congregationalists, 1630s in London. Uh, and then you really don't get another one added in until, because Presbyterians are just another name for the Reformed. Uh, you don't get another one added in really to the Methodists. Uh, any large one until the Methodists in the 17, late 1700s because 
Wesley wanted them to be part of the Church of England. He meant them to be Anglican. And then in the 19th century, you have a proliferation of those uh, denominations splintering into lots of other groups. What are denominations good? And then you have the whole rise of Pentecostal denominations in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. What are denominations good at doing? The next well, question is going to be, what are they yeah, bad at doing? Yeah, yeah. What are they at, good at doing? At their, at their best, they help pre-select a group of Christians for you to know you can work with. So you could just try to find every minister in Birmingham who agrees with you on church structure or on baptizing babies or not. But instead, denominations allow you to know ahead of time, okay, the people over here, that's, they've made this choice. So if you're calling your church like the river, well, then nobody knows. And maybe you think that's good to reach outsiders. But if you'll just humbly call yourself like, you know, Bull Street Baptist Church, well, then people know you're not going to baptize babies. And you, you have a little beef with that. I, I think Names. there's a humility and a wisdom about it, but, yeah, about being honest about your denomination in your name. Okay. But that's just a tiny personal <laughs> preference. I could be wrong. You know. <laughs> what are denominations bad at? Well, every denomination that disagrees with Baptists is wrong on everything they disagree with about. So they are bad about that. So name, name a denomination. Uh, I, I didn't mean so much to go through specific denominations. What are they individually bad at? I guess I'm thinking more about... Are there Denominationalism. Dangers? Is there a danger in denominational thinking, denominationalism? Yeah, pe people can develop a kind of identity that's too fundamental. Like, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a White Sox fan. And that's just, that becomes too fundamental to my identity. Well, that's not realistic, but I'm a Baptist. Right. I'm only going to associate with Baptists. You're saying that. Right, yeah, that's, it's like when I hear the statistic about how many Southern Baptist churches there are in a place, I'm thinking of what eternal significance is that statistic? I want to know how many Bible-believing churches there are that preach the gospel in a place. That's going to make the difference for people eternally. That statistic I care about a lot. You know, where those churches that are Bible-believing happen to send their mission dollars is of some interest, but it's not vital for gospel issues. So there's, there's a wrong kind of tribalism and denominationalism where we wrongly elevate the importance of structures of cooperation to the point that where they seem to eclipse what it is we're really there to cooperate about. In your own role as a senior pastor, why have you led Capitol Hill Baptist Church to cooperate with the Southern Baptist Convention? Uh, our church had been cooperating with the Southern Baptist Convention for decades before I even got there. Now, what I did, I, I tried to renew that. They were down to like giving $1,000 a year, and that was it. That was their cooperation. And I think it was more, it was just a kind of conservative, slightly northern-leaning, independent evangelical kind of church, though Baptist historically. Uh, I came in and wanted to support the cooperative program. Uh, I wanted to support the IMB, the seminaries, because I think it's just, it leverages the Lord's money well. One of the things that I thought of specifically was if the Lord gives us revival and we do see many young people come to know the Lord, Lord willing, we're going to see a lot of people want to go be missionaries. When you preach Romans 10, that starts motivating people to live their lives a little differently. You know, they want to make sure that people hear the gospel. And you're going to start getting people wanting to be missionaries. Well, if, if they're young people, they're not going to be able to pay for all these missionaries that Lord willing would be raised up. But the Southern Baptist Convention, because of the cooperative program, would be able to fund them. So if we could send them and the IMB would take them, then the other Southern Baptist churches could help us send missionaries. So larger Southern Baptist churches being involved really help not just themselves. And often these days, larger churches kind of don't get much help from the SBC. The larger churches that are involved in the SBC, it's a kind of almost a kindness. It's all the tens of thousands of smaller churches with 30 people and 70 people and 150 people who are enabled to do lots of stuff that they would not have the money to do by themselves, that because they're cooperating together, including with some large churches, there is now money where they can do all these things. So because well now we're a, we're a larger church, you know, at least by Northeastern standards, we have over 900 members. So we're, you know, we're kicking in a few hundred thousand dollars a year into Southern Baptist world. And I don't know, Andy, do, Andy, do you think we take up more money than we give to the SBC? Okay, we're, we're still getting out of it more than we're giving, but we're trying to give, and uh, we would like to be in a position where the giving that we're doing as a church is helping other churches be involved and be able to send people that they can't send on their own. Do you assume every member of your church knows that you're a Southern Baptist church? 
I do not assume that every member of our church knows we're Southern Baptist Church, though they were taught it in the Membership Matters class. So you ever have conversations where people are like, well, wait, wait a second, we're SBC? Have you ever had that conversation? Yeah, not often, but yeah. And have people objected? Have oh, members yeah. of your church oh, objected to being Southern? Yes. Why do they object? How do you handle those objections? Well, they object for various reasons. Some people have had a bad experience with the Southern Baptist Church in the past. Uh, some people just know the history and like we were founded to make sure slaveholders could be missionaries. Well, that's not really an attractive background. Uh, that doesn't commend the gospel. Um, you know, some people are going to be just not like denominations in general. And they think of Southern Baptist, which is one of the largest, most well-known Protestant denominations. So there can be various reasons for the objections. Are there ways in which your partnership with the Southern Baptist Convention has been a burden? A yeah, challenge. you're asking me a that challenge. at the SBC. Yeah, that's a, it's clever of you, Jonathan. It's, a, it's the politic nature I've come to expect. Um, I remember you saying, hey, you can ask me anything. All right. Uh, yes, it's a burden sometimes. Uh, I think when the S I trust, I trust people out here who are partners sometimes feel that burden. This is your opportunity to pastor them. Yeah, yeah. Let's not pretend like everything's great all the time. Right. Uh, yeah, any denomination that's large is going to make decisions that you're not going to agree with. And, uh, you know, if you continue to be known as being associated with that denomination, you just can't help but be associated with things that you think are less than optimal. Uh, but then you thank God for all the good things. And you realize that your own church is a lot like that, and your own life is a lot like that. So, yeah. So do you encourage church planners to associate with denominations? Uh, yes, although I want to make it really clear they're not necessary. They're not in the Bible. I think it's just a good prudential way for you to find especially fellowship as a pastor. And I actually encourage people particularly to associate with the Southern Baptist Convention. I think it's, it's an easy and good group to work with. There's a story from George Whitfield about he's mimicking Father Abraham speaking into heaven. Any Anglicans out there? Any, any Anglicans? Any Methodists? Any Lutherans? And no, the answer no comes... Anglicans. No Anglicans. Any, yes. any Lutherans? No Lutherans in heaven. Any Methodists? No Methodists. Well, what do you have there? Only Christians. Right. Um, you cooperate and agree with other denominations where you agree theologically, like a Presbyterian, a conservative Presbyterian, more than you would say a liberal Baptist. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. So how do you, okay, so you have your SBC alliances, but then you have other kinds of alliances. Sure. G give me an example of that and how that works. Well, again, you, you form cooperative relationships with other churches depending on what you're working on. So there may be some things you can work with a local mosque about. If you and the mosque both agree that this other thing over here is immoral, work with the mosque. You know, work with the synagogue. Pornography or something. Pornography it may be. Though they might accept some things we wouldn't accept. I mean, you know, but, yeah. Uh, there'll be other things you could work with Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox about. Uh, you know, but those are going to be more social issues. By the time you get it all theological, you've got to have Protestants, and you've got to have Bible-believing Protestants. Because liberal Protestants you probably have less in common with than you do Roman Catholics. So liberal Protestantism is really another religion. I mean, that's... J. Gresham Machen, Christianity and Liberalism, great book to read if you've never read that. M-A-C-H-E-N, J. Gresham Machen, Christianity and Liberalism. My pastor is reading that with a bunch of men in our church this summer. Yeah, it's a great, great book. I, I remember when I used to be your pastor. <laughs> Those were good days, weren't they? So that's your pastor now? But I've moved on to other you good days. You left me for him. Okay. God gives and he gives, yeah, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the so, point is, so, 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 so Protestant liberalism is another religion. Uh, but inside Protestantism, there are a number of evangelical groups that you can have a lot to do with. I retreated some of Matt Pinson recently, who's, who's head of the Theological College for the Free Will Free, Baptists. Free will Baptist. And uh, Matt did a great piece on the local church that as a Baptist, I've just got a ton of agreement with him about. Now, I know because he's, he's free will, Arminian, we do have some disagreements, but we have a lot of agreements. Uh, I would have more agreements soteriologically with a lot of people here in the SBC uh, but, hey, for different matters, you can cooperate with different guys for things. See, I think one way to guard against the kind of Baptist, I'm a Baptist sectarianism that you were talking about before, and I think maybe it was more characteristic of, of evangelical churches, I don't know, 100, 150, 200 years ago. Oh, I can remember, yeah, was, it was about 100 years ago. Was, was the ability, is the ability to work in multiple lanes. So you have your denominational lane, and that's a good thing. But yeah. you also have certain theological lanes that you work in where, say, together for the gospel. You share certain assumptions there. You work there. You, and you have 
things in DC you do. And uh, I've appreciated your example, brother, being able to work at multiple lanes based on multiple kinds of agreement. And I think that's healthy. Yeah, I want to persuade my Methodist friends to agree with me on the gospel, you know, and on, on not just prevenient grace, but electing grace. I want to persuade my Presbyterian friends to agree with me on baptism. You know, you never want to give someone baptism before you would give them the Lord's Supper. You know, they know not to give them the Lord's Supper. Right, it's just that same thing. Think about baptism like that. But I don't want to coerce any of them into doing it. I want them to really think that. If they don't think that, I want them to be free to meet with other Christians who read the Scriptures as they do. But then because we agree Jesus died on the cross for our sins, there's so much we can work with them about. Just as an example of sort of appreciation of non-Baptist Christians, this little book, What is Healthy Church?, I dedicated to Harold Purdy, and uh, Wally Thomas, and, and, and here, Harold Purdy is my Southern Baptist pastor growing up. Uh, Wally Thomas was the pastor of First Methodist Church in Madisonville, a dear Christian brother, loved the Lord, and Ed Henniger, the Presbyterian pastor in the church I attended in college. Wonderful man, loves the Lord. Yeah. Interdenominational you. Okay, like every institution. Southern Baptists aren't the only ones that have the gospel, praise God. Amen, that's right. But we work within the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a mixed bag of health and unhealth like every organization. Yeah. Do you have any concluding remarks to help pastors think through their partnerships with denominations, how to be good stewards of it? Yeah, when you're praying through John 17, which is a wonderful, rich prayer. And Michael Reeves' new little book on prayer, by the way, what's it called? It has that yellow cover. Uh, Willie? You got anything? No. Enjoy your prayer life. There we go. It's a wonderful little book on prayer to get and read. He, he goes to John 17, and he shows how it's God inviting us into fellowship with himself uh, in the Trinity. It's just a beautiful book. When you work through that, and you're trying to practically think, what, what difference does this make for me as a pastor? Don't think about some great committee where you join up with a local UCC church or United Methodist church. You think of the relationships you have with other Baptist pastors in your area or other Bible preaching, you know, Bible church pastors or Presbyterian pastors or Acts 29 or Assembly of God pastors, people who are preaching the Word of God, who agree on the gospel, and you work on your personal relationships with them and see what might come from that, what things your churches might be able to pray about together and maybe even do together. That's the kind of ecumenism that counts. That's the kind of Protestantism that is, is vital and living and growing and attractive, not some grand uber scheme to get everybody in the same organization. Your last question, your favorite thing about the Southern Baptist Convention? I, I, the, I, mean, I mean the convention. I mean these two days, three days. Uh, I appreciate the fact that we have an ability in the Southern Baptist Convention for faithful churches to exercise such immediate control over the, the, the entities of the denomination. I don't know of another large denomination like it. In all the other large denominations, it pretty much goes the other way. The top controls. And uh, I've had dear friends in Presbyterian and Episcopalian denominations have to pay millions of dollars to get the rights to their own building that their people paid the money to build. And Southern Baptists don't do that. Southern Baptists know that the church is in the New Testament. The convention is not. The convention is a passing instrument that the churches choose to create and use for particular purposes. And we have no illusions about who has the authority in Scripture. It's the local church. See, I thought you were going to say time with your staff. That's good, too. Come on. It's really good with the way we do it. It's our staff time together each year. If you see me walking around with a bunch of other guys, it's because it's our pastoral staff time away together each year. Thanks for your time, brother. Thank you, brother. John, I hope it's okay. I borrowed